we've spoken a lot about our heritage and those things this uh, this weekend, but I, I want to talk to you about today. What does it mean to be apostolic? I wonder uh, how many apostolics there are in the house today. I think I, I think I've come into an apostolic church today. Amen. Let's lift our hands where we are. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your presence that is so evident in this place today. I pray, Father, that you would move amongst us today. Lord, that your power, that your glory, Lord, that it would move and that it would transform every soul. Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise for all of these things. And everyone said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbor and ask them, what does it mean to be apostolic? Turn to your other neighbor and say, you're about to find out. Praise God. Some may ask the question, what does apostolic mean? When people drive by uh, down the road and and uh, they see the church sign apostolic on the road all across the United States. When they see the word apostolic, uh, many people, first of all, have to take their time sounding it out often uh, to uh, pronounce it properly. My grandmother still cannot pronounce the word apostolic properly. And so it brings to question uh, a lot about who we are whenever uh, you say that you're apostolic, oftentimes it brings questions. Uh, do some in this room today, maybe guests, maybe those who are uh, newly acquainted with the apostolic church or apostolics in general as well, wonder who we are. What does it mean to be apostolic? The word apostolic, the etymology of that word, means like the apostles. And so whenever we look at the word apostolic and we try to uh, make ourselves uh, equivalent to that, we have to look and see what the apostles were in the word of God. Yeah. And so if we're going to claim to be like the apostles, then we have to look and see what the apostles did, what they lived, what they preached. And understanding this is important. Why is it important to be like the apostles? Well, the reason is very simple, because the Lord himself prayed for the apostles. He said, neither pray I for these alone, but for all of those that would believe on me through their words. So when he prayed for the apostles, in essence, he prayed for you and I, because he said, I'm not praying only for these 12 apostles, but I'm praying for everyone that will hear their words and that will believe on me according to their words. And so we are apostolic if we believe upon the words which they have given us about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to uh, break it down uh, for you today. And we need to evaluate ourselves. Do we really preach, teach, and live what the apostles preached, taught, and lived? So I'm going to break it down for you today. And uh, I'm going to be using the word apostolic. And I don't know, I want to ask our media minister today to just put the word apostolic behind me. And I'm going to make it easy on you today. The word apostolic. And we're going to break down this word apostolic today. And I hope that each one of us could do a self-evaluation of ourselves according to this word and how we break down this word apostolic. First of all, what is the uh, first letter of the word apostolic? Oh, I didn't get much excitement, so I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to do it like uh, we used to do pep rallies back in high school. Give me an A. a. Oh, there it was. All right, now, now we get excitement. A. Apostolics are anointed. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 1 and 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Church family, where would we be without the anointing power of the Holy Ghost? I want to submit to you today this topic. I am grateful that I am anointed. And I know that you are grateful that you are anointed. But our anointing should not just be something that is displayed inside of this assembly. But the anointing power of the 
God has anointed me with his power and with his glory. And the anointing comes with the spirit of God. We have in the church anointed worship and anointed preaching. Yeah. Why? It's all because of the spirit of the Lord Amen. that is upon apostolic. David spoke of the good shepherd saying, Thou anointest my head with oil. Yeah. Has anyone here ever had their head anointed with oil before? Right now, I'm not talking about just a dab will do you anointing. Just, you know, we're on a budget, so we just put a dab will do you at the church usually. But, uh, when, at at uh, the barber shops in India, when you go to get a haircut, they'll ask you, Do you want us to apply oil and they will actually pour oil on your head and massage it uh, into your head. It feels good. I like it. But it's interesting that David talks about the anointing as he's talking about his shepherd's relationship with his sheep. The reason is because that shepherds did indeed anoint the heads of their sheep with oil. It wasn't just after they got sheared and got their hair cut. <laughs> there was a particular reason for this. In the Middle East, there was and is a fly that is called the nasal fly. The nasal fly is fly that will land on nasal. This is deep, folks. Okay. And it will lay its eggs in the moist, warm, soft tissue of the nose. Now, looking at the time, you've probably not had your lunch yet. You probably won't want to have your lunch after this. Okay. But when those eggs hatch, the larva will climb up inside the nasal cavity of the sheep and will drive the sheep crazy. Listen, the larva, is that just gummy, I'm telling you. Yeah. The larva will drive the sheep crazy. Uh -huh. And the shepherd, remember the Bible says that the shepherd knows the sheep, right? And so the sheep will react in this manner. When the nasal fly uh, lays its eggs and the larva hatches in the, in the nasal cavity, the first thing that the sheep will do is separate itself from the rest of the fold. Come on now. Come on. Yeah. They will stop eating. Yeah. They will bang their head up against the brush and rocks, trying to get the larva of that nasal fly out of their head. Yeah. Oftentimes they will starve to death or kill themselves by knocking their head up against the stones. Mm -hmm. Come on, Come on. When you look at that through spiritual eyes, yeah. faces of people that have once worshipped alongside of you come to mind, don't they? Yes. Because the Bible tells us that another name for Satan is Beelzebub. And Beelzebub means absolutely Lord of the flies. So we know very well that Satan has those flies buzzing around your head, trying to plant themselves inside of your head. This is what the anointing power of the Holy Ghost can defend you against. This is the reason why that we need anointed preaching, anointed prayer, anointed praise, anointed worship, because the shepherd knows the sheep. Amen. Right. Amen. The shepherd with his own hands will anoint that head with oil and massage that oil into that sheep's head. We know that we have an anointing upon us through the Holy Ghost that has the power to destroy, not just break, but to destroy every yoke of bondage. Church family, I want to tell you today, we need the anointing more now today than we ever have in our lives. I wonder who in this place today could say, it's been a little while since I have been anointed.
anointed with fresh oil. I wonder who can say to God today, Lord, anoint me with fresh oil today. I'm moving on. Apostolics are anointed. Jesus. Give me a P. P. Apostolics are prayer warriors. Yes, Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer. Some people say, well, apostolics, when, when do you eat? If you pray, well, you don't understand the word, the difference between the word continually and continuously. Yeah. Amen. Right. Just do a study on that when you leave here. We will give ourselves continually to prayer. Yeah. Church family, that is what God is calling us to be. Amen. Apostolic. Giving ourselves continually to prayer. The apostles understood the power of prayer. They had unshakable faith in the life-altering effects of prayer yeah. and intercession. Yeah. They had learned to pray from the Master Himself. When they heard the passion of the Messiah's prayer, they asked Him, Lord, teach us to pray like You pray. Yeah. And I want to tell you today, when you pray, you will receive. The Bible tells us, ask, and ye shall receive. Lord. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Church family, we need to get a hold of prayer. We need to start asking, seeking, and knocking in prayer. And I know that God will supply each and every need according to His riches in glory. Amen. Amen. If you've not got your answer yet, just follow Acts 6 and 4. Continually. Amen. Continually. Continually pray. Let's get on fire with prayer. Let me yes, move it real close. Right here. What day of the week is prayer? Tuesday. Great. Same as our home church down in southern Indiana. Okay. How many members in the church? 85, 90. Okay. You had prayer meeting Tuesday? How many were here? Uh, I'm moving in real close. I know you know we laugh and we have fun with little things here, but I'm about to bust you in the nose. Church family. Apostolics yeah. are supposed to be prayer wars. Is it a possibility that this is a coin that has gotten oh, lost yeah. in the shuffle? Yeah. 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 Oh boy, cold wind just blew in. I just threw a cold cold towel right on you right there. He just talked about the anointing and then old boy smacking us around now. Oh, church family, hear me today. Yes. Come on now. Yes. Yes. Prayer Amen. is a privilege for us today. Yes, it is. But it's also, as a Christian, a requirement to remain in good standing with our boss. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. Church family, prayer meeting Tuesday night. Let's rally out for prayer meeting. Yeah. Can the church say amen? amen? We need to get a hold of the horns of the altar and understand the power of prayer in our life. Yeah. You want to see your family touched? You want to see souls changed yes, and transformed in this assembly? It can and it will happen when we give ourselves continually to prayer. There are people all around the world that are faithful to praying to God's idols that have eyes that cannot see, hands that cannot reach. Muslims every day are putting their face in a carpet five times a day praying to a God that they believe a goal is set between them and their God that they can never get close to their God. Yet we understand and we have revelation that we can boldly go before the throne of grace yet we oftentimes do not initiate our prayer. We need to do it. We need to get a hold of it. Apostolics are prayer warriors. Apostolics are anointed. Give me a note! Oh, here's an easy one. Apostolics are... Oh, that's a good one, too. I might have to change this sermon. Apostolics are oneness. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. For, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all Jesus that I pray to today. I'm so thankful that I have a revelation 
28, 19, when he said to go and to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, many people stumble over this scripture, saying, here's the evidence of the Trinity. Yet whenever Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, he preached baptism only and exclusively in the name of Jesus Christ has been the entire book of Acts. So it's interesting to me today. When we look at this, we have to explore the purpose, what happened between Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 2, 38. Come on. It's very simple. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospel. Synoptic, sin, and optic, two words meaning same eye. Which means that the writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, saw everything through the same eye. Though it's kind of inaccurate because we know that Luke was a Gentile and he actually didn't see the Lord with his own eyes. But because he had perfect understanding of all things, he decided to write. So he tells us in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 45 that the Lord opened up their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Matthew didn't record that, but Luke understood that. So what happened between Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 2 and 38? Very simple. He opened up their understanding. Yeah. There was a revelation that took place, something Praise spiritual God. that the others failed to write about. But Luke said, it's that important for me to mention. Amen. And it's because of that. Whenever the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost and, they, and Peter stood up to preach, he said, you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And the reason was because he knew that the name of the Father was Jesus. Yeah. And the name of the Son was Jesus. And the name of the Holy Ghost was Jesus. Jesus said, I'm coming my Father's name. The angel said, you're going to call his name Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost, the Comforter to you in my name. I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. He is God in the Father, God in the Son, and God in the Holy Ghost. We spoke about yesterday. Our post apostolic father, Sibelius. We're all Sibelians in this place today. He said that he's father in creation, yeah. son in redemption, Holy Ghost in regeneration. Yeah. That is the one God that we serve. Amen. 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 Someone asked me one time, Do you believe in the Trinity? Or I said, If you don't believe in the Trinity, they were surprised. I said, Well, my Trinity is different than yours. Mine. Mine is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yeah. That's my Trinity. If there's a Trinity, I want to read that. But I want to believe you. Oh, yes. Amen. Yes. Give me an S. Yes. Uh, apostolics are sanctified. Oh, yeah. First Corinthians 6 and 11. And such were some of you, but you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. Amen. Verses 9 and 10 of this portion of Scripture, Paul names many sins. He proclaims that those who are guilty of such sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said in verse 11, such were some of you. That's right. and I would imagine if I was to uh, make that list today and say, this is some of you, oh, I'd probably see heads nodding and hands being raised because certainly such were some of you. Yes, sir. But he said in verse number 11, such were some of you who used to be a sinner, oh. but now you have been washed. Yeah. Now you have been sanctified. Yeah. Now you have been justified. Now, let's break it down. Sanctified. Listen. Sanctified means to be made separate. Let me say it frankly. Apostolics are not like the world. Yeah. We're in the world, but not of the world. If Joseph could survive Egypt without allowing Egypt into his heart, I would submit to you today, you can do the same thing. You can be an overcomer of the world. Paul was very clear in Ephesians 4 and 7. He says, don't walk as other Gentiles.
Gentiles walk. This is the reason God has called us to be separate. We are the light of the world. Listen. Our teachings of separation are important. They are a landmark that is important. And if that hedge is removed, then we will be bit by the serpent. That's right. I'm in the Word right now. There are certain fads and fashions that are changing in this world. The church family, the biblical style, still remains the fad for apostolics. Amen. 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 That's true. Did you hear me? Yes. I cannot allow my style, and I'm not just talking about apparel, that's a big part of it, but I cannot allow my attitude, yeah. I cannot allow my actions yeah. to be tainted by the world. Amen. Amen. Church family, listen. I would that every one of you would understand the revelation of biblical separation, Amen. both inwardly and outwardly. Yes, sir. Yes. Listen. Yes, sir. Jesus was very clear about his teachings of separation. Whenever he approached the Pharisees, the Pharisees looked good on the outside, but on the inside, there was an issue. He told them very frankly, he said, you're nothing but whited sepulchers. You look pure and white on the outside, but on the inside, you're not clean. Jesus was clear. He said, I would that you were clean both on the inside and on the outside. Yeah, I know some people that look the part Come on. and that speak in tongues beautifully but can't talk properly about their brother and their sister. Yeah, that's right. Oh boy. Church family, our holiness and our separation is a beautiful thing. Let's hang on to it. Let's not scorn people that may not be on the same level of revelation that we're on. Let's pray for them. Everyone is at a different stage of the process. Let's pray that our brothers and our sisters who continue to grow in grace and in knowledge and in understanding of what God wants them to be. It's important. Apostolics are sanctified. So it does matter what we look like. It does matter what you set before you, before your eyes. It does matter where we go, and it does matter what we say. Amen. Apostolics are meant to be sanctified. Amen. Not to walk after the way of the Gentiles, but to walk in the Spirit. The Bible is clear. Amen. You walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right. Amen. Give me a tea. Apostolics are tongue talkers. Oh, yeah. Come on, somebody. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And everyone spoke with tongues. I said everyone spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Some maintain that tongues is not important. And that is only a sign for the unbeliever. Yet they completely negate the fact that Mark then and said it like this. He said that these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. It's a sign of the believer. It's a sign for those that believe. Church family, I want to tell you today. It is important that we hang on to this doctrine. And that we preach the Holy Ghost. Evidenced by speaking in other tongues. Not to see the tongues. But to see the one God that kills us. Giving the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Amen. Amen. Some people today, some, some people that claim to be apostolics are now getting away from the teaching of the evidence of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. They got the oneness, they got the Jesus name baptism, and they say, well, yeah, you know, when you look at the book of Acts, some uh, received the Holy Ghost and they prophesied. Some received the Holy Ghost and they spoke the scripture boldly. And some received the Holy Ghost and they completely forget about what Jesus said. In John 3 and 8. That's right. But he said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and now here's the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Yeah. Everyone that is born.
born of the Spirit. This was a prophetic word and a proverb that was spoken by the Lord. Listen. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. He's speaking prophetically of the day of Pentecost. Right, yeah. He was getting our attention to that very particular point. Yeah. He was letting us know that everyone that is born of the Spirit is going to have the same evidence that they have on that day. Yeah. That day when the wind is going to blow. Amen. Nicodemus didn't understand it then. But all of Jerusalem understood it not long after. Yeah. Because when the Holy Ghost was poured out in Jerusalem, it began to spill out into the streets. It spilled out into the regions abroad. And it's come all the way to Mishawaka, Indiana today. Church family, I want to tell you, I'm godly proud as the Apostle Paul was when he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Yeah. I'm godly proud today that I'm a tongue talker. And I believe that I'm surrounded by some people as well experience to know what it's like to have a Pentecostal experience. Just like on the day of Pentecost, I have received the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Amen. Give me an O. Now I, I see I already said apostolics were oneness. But I believe it so much, I just want to just say apostolics are one. Yes, sir. Again. But it's a little bit different than oneness this time. Listen. 1 Corinthians 12, 19 through 20. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, but one body? Church of the city. We are oneness today. Yes, we are. As a body of Christ. Praise God. And it would behoove every one of us if we would endeavor at all times to remain in oneness with our brothers yes. and with our sisters Amen. of life precious. Come on. The Bible says. In Acts chapter 2, my text today, that everyone that believed they were all together and they had all things common. That's how oneness they were. And you and I, as the church of the living God, need to learn how to be oneness. And oftentimes, listen, it's going to require you to take the higher road. You're going to have to look beyond criticisms that are going to come. And those of you that do criticize, you're going to have to start removing the beam from your own eye first. And then from your brothers. Listen, it's important that we remain close together as a family. As the church of the living God. The first part of being apostolic is our oneness in doctrine. And we believe that so strongly, yet when we talk about being oneness as the body of Christ, so many times we are left wanting. There is ever a time, if there is ever a time to be unified, it's now. Yes, sir. In this day and age, Satan is trying his level best to separate families, both physical and spiritual. And as a church, we must understand that we are all in this together. Yes, we are. We must understand that no man is an island. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. We need to ride together, yeah. having an apostolic brand upon us, having understanding that we are brothers and sisters of like precious faith. Amen. But to do this, listen, to do this, we have to learn how to forgive. That's true. That's true. Did you hear me? How many church splits have happened just because we were selfish and didn't know how to deal with conflict? Jesus gave us the example of how to deal with conflict. Whenever he was asked, how many times do I forgive my brother? Jesus said, not seven times. 
70 times 7. What would happen? You know, we take scripture literally in so many ways, but this scripture right here, we just seem to not be able to measure up to something. I'm talking about generally as a church body. We have got to understand that together and united, we are a force to be reckoned with. Yes, so Satan knows, let's not be ignorant of his devices. Right. Satan knows if he can separate us, if he can partition us, if he can dilute us, if he can get us to stop forgiving our fellow. Yeah. He knows that he is diluting our power. And he is reducing the potency of Holy Ghost power and influence right. that we could be in our cities right. and in our communities. Yeah. Not just right here, but all around the world. One thing I've noticed around uh, the world, having traveled to 14, 15 countries, is that though there's different foods, different languages, three things remain the same. God, Satan, and people. People in India, they battle with forgiveness too. People in Burma, battle with forgiveness too. People in Russia, battle with forgiveness too. But the very same God, the very same devil, is there the same way that he's here. So, if these are three constants... And one thing we have to do is try, we're either going to fall under the influence of Satan or we're going to allow the influence of God right. to overtake us. I want to be on the side of God. Amen. Amen. Whenever he had no reason to pray the prayer of forgiveness on the cross, he did it. And so he said, who I have forgiven, you forgive. And we understand that if we say we love God and we hate our brother, the love of God is not in us. Church family, we've got to learn how to be oneness. We've got the doctrine down. We understand it. We understand our baptism very well. But the oneness that the apostolics had in the book of Acts is something that we need to really work on mirroring in this day and age that we live in. The Bible tells us, and we can really deduce it quite easily that Paul did not like Mark too much. We know this. Paul and Mark didn't get along. Really, Peter and Paul, yeah, I think they loved each other, but they would take a shot at each other every chance they could too, about who they would eat with. And, and Peter eating with sinners, and then Paul, and then when one or the other would see the other one eating with sinners, they'd blame that one too. They were all mixed up. They were people. Mark didn't, Paul didn't like Mark because Mark abandoned Paul and his team one time whenever the persecution got very heavy. Paul fled, left them there. After this, there was contention between them. A sharp contention. It separated Paul and Barnabas. It separated many people. But at the end of his life, Paul told Timothy, bring my coat. Bring the books, bring the parchments with you. Come quickly. But also when you're coming, bring Mark with you. Right. Because at the end of Paul's life, he understood the separation had done nothing positive for him. Amen. He understood that separation and conflict and contention was not fruitful. So he said, bring Mark with you because he's profitable for the ministry. Right. Church, that's the example of the apostles. Amen. And so if we are going to be apostles, we've got to let bygones be bygones. Yes, we've got to learn to love Amen. and to forgive Amen. our brothers and our sisters. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord? Give me an L. Apostolics love God and our neighbor. I'm going to speed it up right here. Apostolics love God and our neighbor. Mark 12, 30 and 31 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
there is none other commandment greater than these. In fact, the scripture goes on to tell us that if we love God and if we love our neighbor, we got these down, yeah, all of the commandments hang That's right. upon these two principles. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. Loving God is something that I think we take life. It's something that we don't maintain properly. I want you to think about it for just a moment. In the book of Revelation, the church at Ephesus was a church. You may think, how could a church be if they don't love God? They lost their love for the Lord. The scripture is clear in Revelation 2. The church at Ephesus had lost its first love. Right. Forgot about its first love. First love being the Lord. The church operated very well. They had the doctrine right. They kept the pulpit clean. They had to endure some persecution. They had to fight against false doctrine. The Lord said you're doing many great things, doing many good things. That's wonderful, but one thing I have against you, you've lost your first love. This was a church. I was preaching uh, years ago as an evangelist in Missouri. And there was a pastor that invited me to go and preach there. And I agreed to go and we had revival. It was a week-long revival that, I'm just going to be frank with you, was the deadest services I had ever been in in my life. I mean, I don't know if God even knew that we had showed up. I mean, it was that dead. No one worshipped. No one got preaching. Altar calls were given. People just looked at me like a mule looking at a new gate. It was dead. I started to go and pray in the sanctuary during the noon hour before the evening services. And in those times, the Lord began to speak to me, began to show me some things. The repertoire of sermons that I had prepared already before that revival, everything changed in those daily prayer vigils at the church. The Lord began to speak specifically, and still no one moved. Not even the pastor. Tears were shed. But from my eyes only. It was a terrible situation. The last service, the Lord gave a warning to them. They chose the curse rather than the blessing. No one moved. I returned there several months later. Whenever I returned, I called the pastor letting him know I was going to be in a revival in another church on the other side of town. And I, just, I didn't know anything that had happened since then. I just wanted to inform him that I was coming. And he seemed distant on the phone, but he said, yeah, I, I may come out there then. And so he never showed up. And I told the pastor that I was preaching for, I said, I called pastor such and such. And he uh, said that he may come. And he said, wow, well, I'm surprised. I said, well, I thought Brother, we're in good fellowship together. He said, oh, it's not that at all. He said, we've had to reach out for him. He said, it wasn't long after you came and preached uh, that the entire church just fell apart. And I said, uh, I'm not surprised. He said, they closed the church and the church is for sale. I tried to reach out to the pastor uh, to no avail. About a year later, I came again to that place and learned that the church, which they had just built, a beautiful church building, they had just freshly built it and it was paid for. The people had money. The pastor himself owned a construction contracting company. 
so they built the church and it was paid for. It had nice property, paid for. Guess who bought the church? A local Islamic educational institute, which turned it into a madrasa, teaching Quran and teaching Islamic studies. I can't explain to you what that made me feel like. To be the last evangelist to preach in the church, what I learned later, the last revival. It was their last opportunity, possibly, to get things right. That church, just I was preaching there a few weeks ago, and I asked some people uh, there in that city, I said, hey, you know, is that Islamic Institute still there? They said, oh, no. I said, the whole building burned down. Some arsonists came and burnt the thing down. Something that was constructed and dedicated for the glory of God became ashes because people had lost their love for God. So don't think that money and physical blessings is the insignia that you love God. We've got to make sure to maintain our humbleness yeah. and our affection and our intimacy with the Lord. Amen. We've got to make sure every day that when we speak it, I love you, Lord. I yeah. love you, Jesus. That it's much more than lip service, but it's words that come from the pit of our gut. Amen. Something that comes from the heart. Amen. Can the church say amen? amen? So this is exactly whenever I heard about the church that was built becoming an Islamic institute and now reduced to ashes, the thing that came to my mind was exactly what John the Revelator wrote that the words of the Lord uh, said to him in Revelation 2, whenever he said, if you don't repent, if you don't go back to where you have fallen from, if you don't fix this problem, if you don't return to your first love, I'm going to remove thy candlestick. The candlestick according to Revelation 1 and 20, is the church. Said, so I'm going to remove the church. This is the reason why it's important that we maintain our love Amen. for God. Amen. I'm going to go quickly right here. Apostolics are influential people. Give me an eye. Ah. We are influential people. Yes. Listen very carefully. Acts 16 or 17 and 6 says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren, up to the rulers of the city crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Yeah. We don't hear a lot about Jason in the scripture. We don't know really very much about him. But the one thing that we do know about Jason and his company yeah. was the influence that they had on their surroundings. Yeah. They had an influence so much so that his testimony was I turned the world upside down. Amen. They were leaders. They understood their role as apostolic believers was to reach out to those that did not know the truth. Amen. They understood that they were not supposed to sit on the revelation that they had, but they were called to reach. They were called to preach. They were called to be the light of the world. They were called to be the salt of the earth. Acts 20 and 26 tells us this. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. The great apostle had that testimony because he understood as an apostolic, I am an influential person. Amen. Could this be a coin that maybe we have lost? Could this be something that we have misplaced, something that we have forgotten? Understanding the power of our influence today. But the apostle said, I've preached it. I've taught it. I have hazarded my all for this purpose. And because of this, I am free. I am pure from the blood of all men. I want to ask you that today. Are you pure from the blood of all men? Have you preached? 
Have you reached? Have you proclaimed this truth? Have you left your testimony with someone who, has, who does not believe? That's what God has called us to do. That's what he has called us to be. And if we are not reaching out to the lost, we are a church that has lost our focus Amen. and our purpose. Amen. If indeed God did not want us to reach out to people to propagate this truth, then the moment you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you would have been raptured. Yeah. Think about it. But we remain for the purpose of being an example. Amen. The salt of the earth. I wonder how many times that we are that example that we need to be. When we go to work, do we work hard? Today is that to offend a non-believer is greater than offending your brother. Because your brother is already saved, but the non-believer, if he doesn't see something attractive in you, will never want what you've got. It's a Jewish teaching that I think needs to spill over into the apostolic church today. We are influential people, but our influence is oftentimes tainted by bad character, by derogatory speech. Church family, let's remember who we are. We cannot leave the preaching and the reaching just to pastor or to the ministering brethren. We have got to get proactive. Each and every one of us, we need every hand in the mix. We need every foot that will go, every mouth that will speak, every heart that will have compassion for the lost and the hurting and the dying. We need everyone to do this mammoth task which God has called us to do. Can you say amen? Amen. Give me a C. C. I hope we've spelled apostolic right today. <laughs> Apostolics are conquerors. Can you say amen? amen. Romans 8, 37 through 39 tells us, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are the church of the living God, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We have the power through him that loved us to take cities and to take nations by storm. Why? Because apostolics are conquerors. We are not weak. We are not also rams. We are conquerors. God has called us to be winners, and that's what we are. We are the church of champions. If you walked into this place today and you feel like a loser, I come by here to tell you, you are a winner because of Christ that loves you. We need not move around defeated when we know that we are made to conquer. This assembly was not created by man. This assembly was created by El Shaddai. And it was not created to buckle. Nor was it created to be filled with people who are defeated and who feel inferior. Right. But this assembly was created to be a salvation station. Amen. A place that is filled with a victorious people. Yes, sir. We are here today, church family, by divine ordinance. Amen. We are here today to be a victorious yes. people. Amen. I've heard it said before, and I think it's so true. You know, Jesus said, I give you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions. We have that power. And I'm going to tell you what. Whenever I lived in India, uh, we utilized that power quite a bit. I crunched a lot of scorpions uh, in our house at our Bible college in India. We had the little scorpions. And when it... Uh, comes down really to scorpions, the smaller uh, 
the more deadly. So if they're bigger, it's actually better. Uh, so when we had little ones, and those things were very dangerous, and uh, I killed many scorpions there in my home. They got, they got all over the place. And, and so I know what it's like to step on a scorpion. Now when it comes to a snake, I called, I called in reinforcements. Uh, with that, I, you know, the Bible says that uh, uh, they shall take up serpents. That means with a hoe or a shovel uh, or a 12 gauge. I take them up after the head is already removed. Um, but with the scorpion, where is the poison distributed from? The tail. And the head is the serpent, right? We used to play the coin toss game that, you know, heads I win, tails you win, like that. Well, I like what Jesus said about heads of the scorpions and the, tail, or the head, tails of the scorpions and heads of the serpents because Jesus told us basically heads or tails. That's right. We win. That's right. Amen. Church family, we are made to be conquerors. We are made to be champions. Don't feel inferior anymore. You can be humble. You can be humble. You can be lowly. You can have a meek spirit. But you must understand that you are a conqueror. That you are a victorious church. We are the apostolic church. And I believe today that God wants us to make sure that we maintain our anointing, our prayer life, our oneness in doctrine. He wants us to make sure that we maintain the teachings of the apostles and the lifestyles that they live Amen. and the victory in which they walk Amen. day after day after day, even in the face right. of that person. Right. I'm getting ready to close. If you would stand to your feet, I want the musicians to come and just get ready to play whatever is on their heart. The beginning of this sermon today, I gave you direction. That I wanted you to look at each one of these points as a coin. Just like the woman in Luke 15 who lost a coin, she could not be satisfied with nine when she knew that she could have ten. Today, for each one of you as well, we cannot be satisfied with nine or eight or seven or six if we have lost something that we know we can get back. So we're going to take some time to pray here today. And in our time of prayer, we're going to light a candle. And we're going to sweep the house. And we're going to find the peace which we have lost. Let's be apostolic today. Would you like to be apostolic today? Amen. Amen. As they begin to play, I want every head bowed, every eye closed for just a few moments. The scripture talks about examining ourselves. That's what we're going to do for just a moment. Where is your prayer life? Where is your soul winning? Where is your victory? Where is your anointing? Where is your love for God? Where is your love for your neighbor, or for your brother? Evaluate yourself. Where are you right now at this very point? Is there a point that maybe you lost along the way? Not one that you threw down in spite of God, but one that you lost just because of life. Just because of walking through life, you maybe mishandled something that you once held very precious now you feel yourself moving away from it. Maybe it's your sanctification. The holiness that you once portrayed in your life, inwardly and outwardly, 
could be any of those things. Something that maybe you misplaced. I want to call the apostolics to the front of this room today. If you're an apostolic, I want you to come. Maybe you've got all ten of your coins today, but maybe there's someone that you can pray for that hasn't. Here's your opportunity. Let's light a candle today. Would you come, church family? Would you come humbly before the Lord? Would you light that candle today and would you begin to sweep the house? Would you begin to sweep the house and find that peace which you have lost? Here's your chance. Here's your opportunity. Now, if you're praying up here alone, I, don't, I really don't want anybody to pray alone. I'd like for him to give someone's up here praying alone. Brother, sister, would you, would you come and pray with somebody and help them in their search for that point, that peace which they have lost? Satisfied by anything ordinary, we won't be satisfied.